Good morning. Good morning. This is Russ and Kitty Walden with Father's Heart Ministry. If we're 10 seconds late for the broadcast, are we going to be 10 seconds late for the rapture? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. Good, Good morning, morning, Wanda. Wanda. <laughs> we sure love our chat buddies. We know we have many, many people who listen to the broadcast uh, after it is posted or they perhaps they're catching it on uh, YouTube. I, I want to let you know that on the website, propheticnow.com, you can not only get a link to the YouTube syndication, the YouTube version of the Bible study after the fact, but we also put up, with help of our employee and friend, Ken Allen, the text-based version. Uh, we now have Matthew and Mark also available on Amazon, a prophetic perspective, Gospel of Mark, a prophetic perspective, Gospel of Matthew, and going forward, we're going to be now editing down these studies and putting them uh, together for paperback distribution as a prophetic perspective commentary. And so this material will be available for you to acquire in that way. Just go to Amazon, look for Russell Walden, you'll find my author page, or just look for my name in the Gospel of Matthew or Mark or whatever, and you'll be able to access that. We have now a manuscript that we're working on, Rivers of God. Uh, it's a message that we brought in Pennsylvania at a church camp with Apostle Ricardo Watson. We're going back to his place day tomorrow uh, to do a week-long leadership conference, uh, the Prevail Conference, but I am working now to get the Rivers of God teaching. You haven't heard teaching on the Rivers of God, such as you will find in this new book coming out. If you look on YouTube, you will see one of the introductory messages in audio for that. Uh, it'll change your life. It'll make a difference in your understanding of what's coming out of you, of the glory of God, to reshape and reorder your life. Today, we are studying Romans chapter 16. This is Paul's second closing. <laughs> getting up and getting out of the status quo. Are you tired of the same old, same old? Are you tired of waiting? Um, the Lord was talking to me this morning for a group of people, and he said, uh, when the grace for waiting is lifted, it is always exchanged with the grace for fighting. Amen. Notice that he called it, Paul called it the good fight of faith. He didn't call it the good weight of faith. Many of you think that your posture before God, your faithfulness before God is about waiting for something, that there are things that you're waiting for that God wants you to be fighting for. Are you listening? Again, I would say to you, it's not the good weight of faith. It's the good fight of faith. And it's two entirely different postures. And so you need to think about you know, the areas where you're impatient. Well, you can't love a devil and you can't be patient with the devil. And so you have to ask yourself, uh, have you been misdirected? You were expecting God to do something. You were wanting to hear from God like going to a palm reader or a psychic. Uh, and what is God going to do? Uh, well, the kingdom of God is motion activated. Jesus said the kingdom doesn't come with observation. And if your idea of waiting on God is observing like the Pharisees, they were the same thing that motivated them to wait for God to do something to bring the Messiah. That same motivation is where they went to get the uh, brashness of heart to crucify Jesus. And so we need to start thinking differently about such things because things are the way they are because of what we're doing. If you want something different, you have to do something different. Now, here's the lie. You know, children are born in hypocrisy speaking lies. Here's the lie that the enemy tells. Well, I've done everything. There's nothing else. I've done all that. Man, I, I could cast out more devils by just following up. And somebody says, I've done all that. Say, I rebuke you, devil. Come out of him in the name of Jesus. <laughs> because that's the lie. And the devil's the father of lies. 
and that's Papa Devil. Uh, Pope Satan is what uh, Dante Alighieri called him in Dante's Inferno. Uh, don't let the enemy deceive you into thinking uh, it's time for God to do something, because what more could he do than what he has already done? Amen. We need to start thinking differently. If you want something different, you have to do something different, but you're doing what you do because of how you think. And a teacher can inform you in the manner that you're already thinking. A father shapes you, actually change, helps you change your mind. Change your mind. Have another thought. You will never do differently until you start thinking differently. That's what the culture of the kingdom God told us through uh, Apostle Warren Hunter years ago. I've called you to raise up a relevant prophetic generation. The prophetic's all about repentance, and repentance is all about have another thought. To raise up a tribe of people that are thinking differently, and because they're thinking differently, they're doing differently, and because they're doing differently, the trajectory of their life is shifting and changing. Are you a member of that tribe? Come on now, let's, let's come together in that dynamic digital spiritual community that is represented by all those who touch on Father's Heart Ministry on a regular basis, let's come together and just know what God has in mind for us. I don't care if you're 7 or 70. We have people in their 90s that are saying like Caleb, give me my mountain. And we have people in their 20s that are hanging up their harps in disgust and walking away and say, oh, I, I just... If, if it doesn't come without some sort of trajectory of response on their part, uh, they just give up. You know, if I have to get engaged, if I have to change, well, the God who never changes requires consistent change from us, that we live in a constant state of change. Here's a couple of things that will help you. Confrontation is not harmful. Confrontation is beneficial. Change is not harmful. Change is is beneficial. Let's quit waiting the good weight of faith because that's not faith at all. Let's start fighting the good fight of faith, shall we? Mm -hmm. That means you go up against, you go find the biggest Goliath in your life and you tweak his nose and you dare him to defy the armies of the living God that are standing with you. How do you do that? You do that by audacious love. You do that like my father said. If you want to walk in the spirit, find out what the flesh wants and do the opposite. You'll be walking in the spirit. <laughs> the biggest Goliath you'll ever defeat is the one on the inside of you that is torpedoing your destiny by provoking carnal responses to sinful situations that are goading you into the place of failure. God is here, people. He is at work in your life and has something different for you than what you've been experiencing. So getting up and out of the status quo. Are you tired? of the same old, same old. God has something different in mind for you. In Romans 16, Paul does, in fact, conclude his letter with explicit expressions of apostolic authority. He mandates uh, these people who had never met him face to face. He wrote this book to the letter to the Romans when they had never met him face to face. And he challenges them, he urges them, he actually commands them to accept some people he would send to them. And they didn't know those, they didn't know Paul, they didn't know these people he was sending. He provoked them also to identify those around them who are bringing them down in defeat. Do you know there are people around you who are contributing to the trajectory of defeat? Might be your spouse. If that's the case, you need to ask the Father how things should look different and how you relate to that person. You, you may be chained to someone that is just not going to live for God. They're just going to coast till Jesus comes. Well, there's a path of progress in the midst of that situation. You don't have to sit there uh, in uh, frustration. You can hear the voice of God, and God will direct you in such a way that circumstances begin to shift, and you can have your... Your victory, even if people as close as family members don't want to go on with God. The Bible is replete with examples of people that uh, wax valiant in battle, that brought the mountains down low and the valleys high and walked on water when they had family members who weren't on board. Uh, 
he assures them. Paul is summing up everything that he's been saying. Like, what is this, Paul? You just tried to give us a theology lesson in Romans. No, he says it's all about what he calls bruising Satan under your feet. I mean, are you giving him a belly rub or are you bruising him under your feet? This is what Paul's summing everything up and says, this is what I'm trying to get you to if you will just listen. And you say, well, what does all that theology have to do with my breakthrough? Well, if you understood what it had to do with your breakthrough, then you could have written the book of Romans, but you didn't. And so, you know, it's in my own life, when I counsel people, when I speak to people, if, if they think they understand what I'm saying, I know they're not listening. Because it is my job to speak to them like the scripture says. Prophets speak in riddles and dark sayings. Why? Because most people aren't thinking breakthrough and the prophet is there to bring them to breakthrough. And so if I don't say things to you that you would struggle to understand, then I can't take you to new territory in God. Because if I only say something to you that evokes the familiar, then all it's going to produce is that which is a familiar. And how many would like to have more of the familiar in your life? You're familiar with failure. You're familiar with downturn and defeat. God has something so much more for you. So, Romans 16, the final chapter of Romans, before we launch into the troubled and turgid past of the Corinthian church for two whole books. Uh, I can't wait. <laughs> Let's read Romans 16, verses 1 through 15. I commend unto you, Phoebe, our sister, which is a servant of the church, which is at Centuria, that you receive her in the Lord as becometh saints, and that you assist her in whatever whatsoever business she hath need of you. For she hath been a, a succor of many, and of myself also. Greet Pris Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers in Christ Jesus. Notice that Priscilla came first. God bless her. She was a you-go girl for God and Amen. wasn't very popular. Who have for my life laid down their own necks, unto whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. Salute my well-beloved Epiphanitis, who is the firstfruits of Acacia unto Christ. Greet Mary, who bestowed much labor on us. Salute Andronicus and Junia, my kinsman and my fellow prisoner, who are of note among the apostles, who also were in Christ before me. A woman apostle, by the way, mm -hmm. identified by Paul himself. Praise God. Greet Amphilius, my beloved in the Lord. Salute your being, our help, helper in Christ, and station, Stachus, my beloved. Bless them all, Lord. Salute Apelles, <laughs> approved in Christ. Salute them which are of Aristopolis household. Salute Herodian, my kinsmen. Greet them that be in the, of the household of Narcissus. I know a lot of people that are of the household of Narcissus. <laughs> I know a whole bunch of people that are related uh, to them. Which are in the Lord. Verse 12. Salute Typhenia and Typhosus. Typhenia and Typhosus. Twins. Bless, bless <laughs> Lord. Who labor in the Lord. Salute the beloved Paris, which labored much in the Lord. Interesting names. Salute Rufus. That one was easy. Cho chosen in the Lord and his mother and mine. mine. Salute Amprinitis, Philion, Hermas, Patrobus, Hermes, and the brethren which are with them. Salute Philogus and Julia, Nerissus, and his sister Olympus, and all the saints which are with them. <laughs> Yay. In the very next verse, he'll say, matter of fact, just salute one another with a holy kiss. Just give everybody a big wet kiss right now. Just give everybody <laughs> a smooch. I, he just missed them so much and loved That's them precious. so much. It's interesting that he wrote this, but yet he didn't, he didn't know any of them in Rome. He had never mm -hmm. come to know them. How did he find out about all these people? He sent them on ahead. These were people that he knew that had been kicked out of Jerusalem and out of Judea and had been sent on to Rome. He knew his friends were there, getting to know this Roman church that he knew nothing about, that he had not been able to visit face to face. So, in chapter 16 here, Paul continues his summation to the Romans of those things on his heart. 
that he believes will be beneficial to them until the time that he can see them face to face. Now we know that at the time of this writing, Paul had not met any of the leaders of the church at Rome, but he felt nonetheless there was an extension of his apostolic authority in their lives. Now think about this. How about you? Is there a leader who may have never met you face to face, but you feel a connection with ordained by God? And perhaps God would have you to open yourself and allow that leader to become formative in your character? Listen, there are many teachers, but not many fathers. A teacher can enlighten you and instruct you, but a father speaks with a developed mental authority in your life. So as a pastor of existing churches, I go in and be asked to pastor a church. Here's the problem with building on another man's foundation. When you try and take them beyond their comfort zone, you they start talking to you like stepchildren. You ain't my daddy. I don't have to do what you say. See, where is that person that can speak formatively in your life to provoke change that mere teaching may promise but cannot deliver? There's a lot of stuff out there in the body of Christ that says if you just learn this, it'll change your life. And that is disingenuous because it's not just about adding something to what you already know or who you already are. There are things, there is change that has to be provoked in your life. And a teacher is not going to change you. You have to be connected with someone who will, see, that's an apostle. He brings the paternity. He establishes the paternity of God in your life and provokes change. And he will call you out on your stuff if you're not willing to change. So are you ready? Are you ready for this? Are you ready for change? Listen, things are the way they are because of what you're doing. If you want something different, you must do something different. If you knew what to do, you would do it. So there must come mentoring. And you listen, it's true. You don't always get that in a brick-and-mortar situation with a guy speaking from a podium. That doesn't mean we don't need the ministry of God's leaders in a traditional setting. See, the Romans had this. The Roman church was a large church with many leaders and elders. Who was Paul that he would so presume to put something out there so controversial and outlandish as this writing that he would go so far as to urge these people like a father speaking to his children. It would be like if I were to write a letter to the members of Oasis of Love, uh, Joel Osteen's church, and actually command them. I'm going to send somebody to you, and I, I command you. You receive Phoebe. She's a dear sister. You help her. Well, can you imagine... How, you could take a church of 10 people that haven't, hasn't seen a soul one to Christ since they established their church 30 years ago, and they would say, who do you think you are? And so that's the metric of measurement of the difference between church as we know it, as church as God wants it. Because church as God wants it is what is revealed in the scriptures, because all scripture is given by inspiration of God for instruction, correction, that the man of God might be thoroughly furnished into all the good works. God did not tell the tale of the modern church in the annals of our canon, but he did tell the tale of these churches, imperfect though they may have been. They are an example for you and I to follow. So, <laughs> these people had, you got to understand, the people at Rome, the Roman church was a huge church. It had many, many leaders, strong leaders. They had ministry leadership in surplus. But here Paul is delivering something to them that they weren't getting any other way. Are you ready for that? Are you prepared? See, a lot of people don't want five-fold ministry because uh, they got all their hands full dealing with the one-fold ministry. The majority of Christianity accepts one ministry as that of a pastor. And uh, you know, if they've got a pastor, they, they don't want the pastor meddling too much in their lives. It's enough for me to juggle one. You're going to give me four more? No, thank you. Because they like things the way they are. They don't want change. Are you prepared for what God has for you that comes outside the parameters of churches you know it, of how things are normally done? Why would God send this letter to these people via Paul? Because they were hungry for more. 
I, I would ask you a question. Are you hungry for more? Then open your heart and open your mind. Open yourself to the real message of Romans. Not, on, not only that this message of Romans will reach you, but that the pattern of leadership that produced the letter of Romans for their sake and ours 2,000 years ago would impact you as well. It's what am I saying? It's what uh, the Song of Solomon opens up with. It's the bride of Christ crying out to the bridegroom, who is Jesus. And she says, let him kiss me with the kisses of his lips, for thy love is better than wine. That meant I don't just want the words that come from his lips. I want intimacy with the lips that spoke that word. So we don't just want what the message is of Romans. We want the caliber of leadership impacting and connecting with our life one-on-one -on -one that produced this letter that so many people struggle with and we read it and we're not sure we understand it. You want to be exposed to that kind of leadership. You want to have that kind of leadership in your life. You want the kind of leadership in your life that produces the character, the quality of ministry that's represented in the writing of the book of Romans. What is that? It's a ministry that the world cannot ignore and the church cannot marginalize. The Roman church it was tens of thousands, perhaps hundreds of thousands of people, but they could not marginalize Paul. They could not ignore Paul. Paul so demonstrates his, as an apostle his authority that he considered, even though he had never met or connected structurally in, in, in the infrastructure of the Church of Rome with their leadership, he felt he had the authority to send other people besides himself into the lives of those that he had not met yet face to face. The Romans in the leadership of the Church of Rome had not met Paul face to face, but he presumed to take it upon himself to urge them by way of command to receive of all things a woman minister. And women you gotta understand, women were just one step above cattle in this in this culture. Women a man when he married a woman, he held the pink slip to her. She was an indentured servant. She belonged to him. And yet here he is, he's sending a woman minister to them and telling her, you, t you receive her, you uh, help her, anything. She he makes the statement, he says, anything she wants to do, you help her do it. Can you imagine the forces, the influence of misogyny? In the Roman church, it says, hold on, just we don't even believe in women ministries. What are you doing? Paul says, I don't care. You help her anyway, because I sent her to you. See, we run into this in our ministry. There are people who are willing to love us and to receive from Kitty and I, but they resist it when we send them someone in our name. If we ask Terry Allen, our administrator, or some member of our board of directors to minister to someone else, people complain, demanding, no, I don't want Tim Fox. I don't want Terry Allen. I want Russ. It has to be Russ and, and Kitty. You know, we saw this when we were baptizing with Lance Wallnow in the Jordan. <laughs> of all the candidates that came, there was like 200 people, and there were four teams. Lance was one of them, uh, to baptize 200 people. And... Uh, as the people came into the water, they were all holding back because they didn't want uh, Steve Schultz or Doreen Schultz. They didn't want Kitty or I. They didn't want uh, Lance's employees if they didn't know who they were. No, they wanted Lance. And I saw Lance literally take them by the elbow and pass them off to the other teams and say, no, you don't get to choose your own death. In other words, if you're a disciple, you are willing to be ministered to in the context of the authority of God's ministers. If you will only accept ministry when it's on your terms, that is certainly your prerogative. But you have to ask yourself, is that the character of a disciple or a follower? And which does that make you? So, Paul sends Phoebe, Sister Phoebe, to the Roman church, instructing them to assist and receive her and whatever she wants to do. When she got there, they were to support her. He, he, they, Paul was saying, you support her like you support me. Are you willing to be a Phoebe? I know I deal with that with our people a lot. I'll say, okay, uh, 
I've trained you, uh, you've, you've been mentored uh, how to move in ministry, and I want you to go minister to these people. And boy, they hold back, says, no, I don't want to do that because they want you. They don't want me, Russ. They want you and Kitty. I don't want to do that. Well, hold on now. You know, <laughs> are you a disciple or are, are you a follower? And then, uh, you know, one thing about Phoebe is Paul knew she would not embarrass him. You realize the blanket endorsement she gave? Said, whatever Phoebe wants to do, you help her do it. He knew Phoebe would not embarrass him. He had discipled Phoebe. He had trained Phoebe. He knew that she would do nothing to harm him and nothing to bring disparagement on his own ministry. It's important to note from this verse that Paul apparently wrote the letter to the Romans because the wording indicates they were sending support to him wherever he was, although he hadn't met them or ministered in their midst personally. In other words, they weren't expecting something for nothing. The letter of Romans was in response to something. They were supporting him, and he was responding to that support. There were transactions of faith initiated on the other side of the inquiry that began with the Romans, and the result was a document of such signal quality that it not only ministered to them, but it's ministered to millions of believers since that time. What kind of gift of support do you think triggered Paul to make such a spiritual investment in them? Let us be that kind of people who so provoke our leaders to pour into us that what they say and do not only blesses us, but 2,000 years from now will be blessing others. Are you listening? Listening with the ear of the Spirit. So, verse 16 through the end of the chapter. Salute one another with a holy kiss churches of Christ salute you. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the gospel, to the doctrine which you have learned, and avoid them. That's important to remember. You know, brother Mark, mark them. Mark them. <laughs> For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good works and fair speeches deceive the hearts, the hearts of the simple. For your obedience has come abroad unto all men, and I'm glad, therefore, on your behalf. But yet I would have you wise unto that which is good and simple concerning evil. And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you, all men. Timotheus, my fellow worker, and Lucius, and Jason, and Sosipater, so my kinsmen salute you. I, Tertius. Tertius. He was the third pastor of the church of Corinth. They, they got tired of naming them by their own name, so they just called them Tertius, number three. Huh. Hi, Tertius. <laughs> Who wrote this epistle, salute you in the Lord. Gaius. 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 Oh, Gaius, my host. And of the whole church, saluteth you. Estrius. Erastus. Erastus. <laughs> The Chamberlain of the city salute you and Cordus. He was uh, the fourth pastor. <laughs> a brother. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Now unto him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets according to the commandment of the everlasting God, may known unto all nations for the obedience of faith to God only. Wise, do glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. <laughs> so after all these greetings and instructions, Paul is just caught up with this need of the people to show their love. You know, he says, salute Priscilla and Aquila, and Androdicus and Julie, and salute this one or that one. But as a matter of fact, just give every one of you just right now Turn around and give everybody a holy kiss. A holy kiss. Let me say something to you. The second church I pastored, uh, we had a unique fellowship. And over the course of over 15 years I pastored there, uh, we moved into a place where we greeted one another with a holy kiss. Now I'm talking about how you would kiss your sister or how you would kiss your brother. We embraced and other people would come in and what made them uncomfortable. The more we were like a New Testament church, 
the more uncomfortable people would get in visiting our church. really bugged me as a pastor because I wanted to see growth. But uh, it, it was rare. And, and to be honest with you, my default response when it comes to a, uh, a sister in the Lord, I stick my hand out and I take one step back behind Kitty. Not because I'm being standoffish or think I'm better than anybody. I don't want to give occasion to the enemy. Because sometimes when you just let the warmth of affection that you feel for people flow, that they interpret it wrong. You don't know what's going on in that person's life. And that's not putting them down. But uh, there are some I'm, I'm comfortable with uh, to greet them and embrace them. Others just, I don't have that comfort. It's not commentary on their character. Uh, but I just, I, I have been a part of a church that could greet one another with a holy kiss. And let me tell you, I do it with tears running down my face. The love that I felt to brothers that I could embrace a man, a big burly guy who was just as robust as he could possibly be and it didn't diminish his own idea of his own masculinity to just kiss me on the cheek and me to kiss him on the cheek. I remember Ron Bro, he's gone to heaven now, powerful apostle, came to our church and he greeted me and he's a big, big guy very t- a lot taller than me, and he just wrapped me up in his big arms and kissed me like a father. Let me tell you something. It, it did something for me that six weeks of meetings couldn't do. It touched my heart and touched my life. So notice the mention of Priscilla and Aquila, Andronicus and Junia. These were couples who were moving in apostolic ministry. They were power couples in the kingdom. Their partnership was so strong that in the case of Priscilla... And Aquila, she was mentioned first as the primary leader. Boy, I'd like to meet her. (laughs) Are you ready for that as a husband to allow your wife's gifting supersede your own or vice versa? There's also an admonition in verse 17 to mark those who were causing divisions. There were people trying to foster division in their midst. And Paul is trouncing all over this and going so far as to say, mark these people and avoid them. Listen, there's a difference between celebrating diversity of ministry and dealing with those who are creating animosity, elitism, and sectarian division in our midst. These are those, verse 18 tells us, that are not serving the Lord Jesus, but serving their own belly. If we tell somebody we are full gospel, what are we saying about ourselves? Are we preaching ourselves or are we preaching Jesus? I think we need to get rid of that. I think we need to lay aside the elitist, effete category we've placed ourselves into because we speak in tongues and go back and join the ranks of the body of Christ, even among those who don't speak in tongues and don't think like we think and don't do like we do. Because I don't think that the cause of Christ has been advanced by us setting ourselves aside as though somehow we have a badge of merit because we accept and believe and practice the primitive uh, gifts of the Spirit that were revealed in the, in the book of Acts and taught on in 1 Corinthians. Uh, you know, people are... Those who bring division among themselves, how can I identify that person? Listen, they are very effective at deceiving people. How do you find someone who is a divider and not a uniter? Here's what they're going to say. Well, I'm just ministering to a few wounded sheep. Mark that leader that talks like that. Look out. Oh, we're just looking out for souls. It's about souls. And then they want to pick a fight with you. Look out. Those words are the earmarks of a deceiver. And you should mark them, and you should leave off following them. I don't care if you've sat in their church for 10 years. If partaking of a ministry leaves you isolated and pointing the finger at everybody else, being wrong, you need to recover yourself. You have been duped by a misleading ministry. Now, whenever you unentangle yourself from that kind of deception, Satan will be bruised under your feet. Notice what he said. He said, if you'll receive the people I'm sending to you, if you will separate yourself from those that are creating division, the 
the net gain of those two actions will be Satan will then be bruised under your feet. So here's the question. Is Satan being bruised under your feet or are you being run over by in the problems of life, brought on by the enemy? See, if you don't have enough peace, enough joy, enough provision, enough of anything, you have to examine yourself. Don't let the enemy tell you, well, I'm just suffering for Jesus. No, you're not. If you're going through something that Calvary paid for, that something that Calvary paid for has nothing to do with you suffering for Jesus. Because Jesus it does not shortchange his customers. He does not make you pay for something twice. Can you imagine? You pay for your groceries, you're on your way out, and say, oh, excuse me, you need to pay for those groceries. Oh, okay, sure, sure. And you just go through, come through the line again, pay for them groceries again. But that's what the church is taught. The church is taught that you're suffering for Jesus when you go through something that he already paid for. That's called stealing. That's the devil. And, there's, and it's nine-tenths of the doctrine of the modern church is telling you, deceiving you into thinking that what you're going through in the enemy is not being put under your feet, is you suffering for Jesus. That's a lie. And just because everybody's saying it does not make it true, does not make it trustworthy. That's right. We need to recover ourselves. Let me tell you something. We need to recover ourselves out of the prevailing sentiments and teachings of Christianity as we know it. Just like if you found yourself in a Mormon church advocating polygamy and all this kind of stuff, you'd say, you need to get out of that. You need to recover ourselves. We need to be deprogrammed. We need to be set free. If Satan is not being bruised under your feet, then ain't nothing wrong. Something ain't right. And two things that Paul says, number one, you need to get this message that's in this book of Romans. You need to receive the people that he sent to them. Now that you need to be a person that are so disciplined that someone you haven't even met can speak with authority in your life and actually send people to you to help you and you can help them on their way. And you need to start marking those that are causing divisions. See, the division is so great and those that are not dividing are in such a minority that we have to separate ourselves from the majority of those. What if the majority of those you're exposed to are the dividers and not the uniters? Are you listening? (laughs) Listen, is Satan being bruised under your feet? Or are you being run over by the problems of life? Don't just look at others, look at yourself. Don't just look at yourself, look at the spiritual environment around you. Your leaders cannot give you what they do not have. You may love them, and they may love you, but they cannot give you what they do not have. Okay, I'm ready to receive it. Yeah, but it's not going to be on your terms. I see a lot of people living lives of defeat, and they go find somebody that's got a greater anointing, but then they demand that person come into their life on their terms. No, it doesn't work that way. That's why Paul said, I don't build on another man's foundation. You know why? Because he went in with Holy Ghost blasting caps and blew up every foundation that the people he was ministering to had till he had bare ground. Oh, we don't have bare ground yet. Let's, uh, let's, let's pull out a little more Holy Ghost TNT. Let's get out a little more Holy Ghost C4. We need to get all this wrong thinking out of people. And usually by the time you're halfway through that in the modern church, people say, well, I didn't come in here to these meetings for that. And they go find somebody else that's going to tickle their ear, that's going to give them what they want. (laughs) Listen, your leaders cannot give you what they do not have. You need to find someone who walks in greater favor than you are experiencing and get under that. The Roman church, they loved their leadership, but they knew. Because, see, the implication is they solicited this letter from Paul by their generous gifts of support. They knew they had to have, by whatever means, what Paul had going on in God. And they made sacrifices to see it happen. You need to find someone. Isn't it interesting that the highest ethic, the highest ministry ethic of most Christians today is that if it costs me anything, uh, it's not God. Well, who's their God? Are you listening to me? The Bible talks about the love of money as the desire to shine. See, who's their God? If they want something that costs them nothing or it's not God, tell that to the Romans. 
who supported Paul. And because they supported Paul, they got a letter that changed Christianity as we know it. Can you imagine? Well, we sent him support. You think he'd come visit us? You think he'd come see us? But he didn't. He sent he sent a woman of all things. <laughs> imagine that. Thank you so much for that generous support. Now I've got a controversial person I'm sending your way. Whatever they want to do, you help them do it. Can you imagine? So you need to find someone with a more massive anointing and a greater open heaven than you are experiencing, and you need to get under that. If listening long distance isn't working for you, then you need to make some decisions. It isn't normal to live a life of downturn or disappointment. And if that's your track record, you have to know that there are things, people, and situations in your life contributing to that condition. And the person who has that greater favor, broader open heaven, and more powerful anointing is not going to answer any questions that you don't ask. Are you listening? So you have to know, are you ready for change? This is Paul's heart in his closing words to the Romans and his closing words to us who read these passages 2,000 years later. So, Father, we thank you for the book of Romans. Lord, it's, it's, like, it's like a Holy Ghost roller coaster. I mean, we visited some pretty lofty theology. We touched on some pastoral problems. We meddled in affairs belonging to another church. Uh, so we've had passages here that are tabloid in nature and others that carry lofty themes beyond that which we struggle to even understand. I pray God not only that you bundle it up and cause it to become life and breath to us. I pray God that you would produce a ministry in our midst that not only can elucidate and articulate letters such as these but can produce letters such as these in our own lives, in your own day, so much so that it'll not only change us, but it'll be changing lives 2,000 years later. In Jesus' name.